and welcome to Ask the Doctor. I'm Diana Felzone, and we are joined by Dr. Disha Narang, who is an endocrinologist. Now, for those that don't know, what is the field of endocrinology? What do you study specifically? Yeah, so the field of endocrinology is both basically studying the abnormalities of the way our hormones function. And, and so what that, it includes a whole host of things. And so you know, starting from the pituitary gland, the pituitary gland is a little gland that sits right below our brain that produces um, several releasing hormones that then talk to the glands in our body to produce, you know, hormones that help um, various functions in our body. And so um, what we study is that when some of these things go wrong, that's where we can help, you know, with medication. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things, um, medications, procedures, things like that. Uh, that may help to um, adjust, you know, uh, some of that abnormal function. And what would be examples of abnormal function? Would it be something like a thyroid issue? Right. So, so we look at the abnormalities of the thyroid, of course, the pituitary gland, um, the, you know, going back to the thyroid, we work with abnormalities of the bone. Um, so the bone itself is an endocrine organ of uh, the pancreas, which is, you know, diabetes, um, you know, the ovaries, the testes, these are all reproductive hormones, um, where reproductive hormones are produced adrenal glands. That's where, you know, several hormones are produced as well. Um, and even obesity. And so that's one of my specialties as well. Obesity is a neurohormonal, uh, you know, uh, abnormality th that causes weight gain, weight loss. Um, and so a lot of the way that our bodies function is an interplay of hormones. Um, and, you know, sometimes when things go wrong, uh, such as, you know, for example, autoimmune thyroid disorders, that's when we can actually help, uh, you know, bring those levels back up or down. Um, there's different, you know, either we can have underactive or overactive uh, glands and hormone levels. So you mentioned something about um, the adrenal uh, glands. Mm -hmm. So I've heard a lot about adrenal fatigue yeah. and it's a catchphrase that I keep hearing. And I, I know there's supplements you can buy online that's supposed to help your adrenal fatigue. Right. What is that? And is that an actual thing? It is not an actual thing. So I will hundred percent come out and say <laughs> that this has been discounted over and over again by the medical community. Um, if we look into any sort of evidence um, about adrenal fatigue there, it has been discounted over and over again. And so, you know, for companies that are selling, you know, supplements for adrenal fatigue and things like that, honestly, it, it, this will come out bluntly, but it's quite a money grab. Um, because, you know, what are we treating exactly? Right. Um, it, either we have overactive adrenal glands that is, um, Cushing's disease, or we have underactive adrenal glands, which is adrenal insufficiency. So adrenal fatigue, like there's no such thing as sort of a middle ground there. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it has become a bit of a catchphrase, unfortunately, uh, and it worries people that they may have it based on some certain symptoms and things like that. But we have zero scientific evidence, um, you know, suggesting that this is an actual disease. Um, and there's no treatment or supplements that are approved for it either. Well, that's very good to know because I think we get presented with a lot of information, especially on social media, things Absolutely. get picked up and then you have to discern what is myth information right. and what is medically fact. Absolutely. And those Absolutely. are two, there's a large gap in between that. So they will have a hard time finding an endocrinologist that supports that diagnosis. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, that's very helpful to know. And, uh, and, and just following up since we're on, on this topic, when you say adrenal insufficiency, would that be a, uh, a large, would that be a piece of a larger diagnosis or is that um, in itself something? Yeah. So, so a couple ways to have adrenal insufficiency. So basically what adrenal insufficiency means is that you have low levels of cortisol that can present with um, difficulties maintaining your blood pressure. So people may have routinely like low and like dangerously low blood pressures. They may have routine um, hypoglycemia. So low blood sugars, uh, they may have a lot of, you know, fatigue symptoms, the headaches, nausea, they may just not be feeling very well. 
And so this is actually a serious diagnosis uh, because what happens is that we need to be able to treat those people with steroid. And so what we use is um, a medication called hydrocortisone, and it's a very low dose steroid to help mimic the way that our own bodies would have produced cortisol. Um, and so the way that we develop adrenal insufficiency, it can be autoimmune and that's called Addison's disease. Um, and that's, you know, just fact, uh, President Kennedy had a, a Addison's disease, and that's why he had such tan skin. So that's a marker, at least for some people, to have um, um, hyperpigmentation, you know, from um, Addison's disease. Um, the other way to potentially have adrenal insufficiency, it can be drug induced. So in, let's say if somebody is on steroids for several months, because of, um, you know, they may have some other condition such as cancer, or they may have, um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, or, you know, some other like rheumatological condition, lupus, things like that, where they require high dose steroids for several months at a time there, because their body has so much of an exposure of high levels of steroid, um, that actually shuts the adrenal glands off so that your own body isn't making its own cortisol. And, and so, um, so that's kind of secondary adrenal insufficiency. Primary adrenal insufficiency is that, you know, the adrenal glands themselves just shut down. And most of the time that can be autoimmune. Very interesting. I mean, your field is, it's, there's so many things that go on with the hormones of the body yes. Yes. and it impacts at, you know, each gender. Um, and you do spec you do specialize in women's health. Um, as it's, I've read, it's definitely and, yeah a very significant clinical interest of mine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, and being that we're endo TV and we're part of the endometriosis foundation, how, I mean, endo feeds off of hormones. We know that estrogen is the fire to the flame of that disease. Right. How does that kind of intercept or, or intersect with your practice of endocrinology? Right. Yeah. So, you know, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of overlap. And so, you know, endocrinology um, doesn't always specifically deal with um, the ups and downs of endometriosis um, because, you know, part of it is procedural part, yeah. you know, whether that may be, you know, actually removing like the endometriosis, like rests, uh, it could be IUD placement. So that's um, a lot of OBGYN, but from a hormonal perspective, you know, treatment with birth control pills, um, you know, estradiol, things like that, that is something that potentially would overlap with endocrinology. Um, and so, you know, along with that, though, people may have other things going on, like thyroid disease and, um, you know, obesity or, you know, fertility issues and things like that. And so, um, you know, from my perspective, there is a bit of overlap, um, although OBGYN often uh, sees these patients primarily. Um, but, you know, especially when people are in menopause or, um, you know, all of that. And so <clears throat> we do have a lot of um, patients that we work with, uh, with endometriosis that, you know, it's almost like we have to work um in conjunction with what is going on, um, you know, from the OBGYN standpoint, uh, so that we are optimally taking care of the patient. You you mentioned two two big things. One was infertility, which we know is it could potentially be caused by having endometriosis. When you go through IVF and um, any of those assistant fertility procedures, egg retrievals, your body is put on so many different suppressions, hormonal suppression, also then kind of filled with more hormones. How, how does that tax on the hormone function of the body? Cause yeah. I, I mean, it has to in some ways. Yeah. You know, um, one thing is that, you know, when patients are on, for example, Lupron injections and things like that, um, they feel like they're in menopause, right? So a lot of these sorts of um, treatments may actually decrease the estrogen levels, um, even though that may help with um, the endometriosis, it may cause these symptoms of menopause. And so it's, um, it's unfortunately a bit of a balance between, you know, making sure that the endometriosis symptoms are uh, under control, but then also the menopausal symptoms are under control. And, and so it is very much an interplay um, and we have to follow the patient, right? There's not a one size fits all solution um, for sure, but we have to work with the patient to understand, you know, what one will make you feel better, what will help with your quality of life, but then also long-term 
what's going on with your weight? You know, has there been any um, changes in sort of, for example, like increased body fat content? Is that increasing insulin resistance? Is that increasing your risk of prediabetes, um, especially with changes in weight and everything? And, you know, from the perspective we're coming from, um, every five to 10 years, our bodies are changing, right? Whether it's preconception, and this is even without all the, you know, fertility treatments and um, hormones and things like that. But even without all that, um, our body changes so much every, you know, five to 10 years that it's, it's tough to keep up, right? Like uh, from metabolically. And what happens over time is that as we go through these decades of life, especially as women, our cardiovascular risk really goes up. Oh. And, and that's what, you know, where we can be really helpful, um, especially from an endocrine perspective, right? Because we are treating patients with prediabetes and diabetes. We're treating patients with high blood pressure and cholesterol. Um, of course, obesity as well. And that may be a whole interplay of all of this, um, or it may just be, you know, singular obesity treatment. However, um, like I said, like we, we have to kind of work on all of it together um, because you don't want to have the situation. And this unfortunately happens a lot. You don't want to have the situation where, you know, someone's gone through all these fertility treatments or hormone treatments and things like that. And then all of a sudden at the end of all of that, well, they're, they feel like completely different. They're at a different size. You know, they're experiencing all these sorts of symptoms of menopause or perimenopause. Um, and it's just, it's not pleasant for people. Right. And so, and that's where I think an interdisciplinary, um, you know, medical team can be very, very helpful through these processes. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. I it's, 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 I've spoken to so many people who've gone through having endometriosis and then the fertility journey and just what they've gone through with the, the roller coaster of hormonal, you know, changes and imbalances. And then what it's like to try to rebound after egg retrievals or after pregnancy. And it's, um, I, I do think that it's important to, if you have the ability to have someone such as yourself, a reproductive endocrinologist, who can help kind of bridge that gap. Um, to but yeah, exactly. And, it, you know, un unfortunately with, you know, the field of endocrinology, there's not that many of us, there's maybe like 7,000 or so um, endocrinologists and, you know, the number of people sort of dealing with some of these metabolic issues, like what, you know, whether it is obesity or diabetes, but then also, um, you know, endometriosis or other women's health issues, everybody is so booked out right now. And so the healthcare system is very tough to navigate. Um, and, and, you know, part of sort of my objective is how do we, how do we reach out to as many people as we can um, over that shorter period of time? Because I think what's happening, especially with women is that women are kind of being left to their own resources to figure out how to navigate the system by themselves um, with all the symptoms that they may be experiencing, you know, and add that to the stresses of, fertility and like childcare and career and all of that stuff. And, and that's where it gets hard. Right. And then our health often takes a backseat to it all. You know, we, you know, and then what I'm seeing, at least in my clinic is that women will finally present to my clinic, you know, in their late forties and fifties, because the children are older or whatever they're ready to have, or they have time finally to address their health and not that it's too late, but it should have been addressed earlier right? It shouldn't oh. have been let go. Yeah. No, I'm glad that you brought that up because we talk a lot about self self advocating. And I always find that to be a double-edged sword because you want to be listened to heard. Of course you have to recognize there's something going on in your body. That's not working properly that, you know, something's wrong. That's step one. But then when you get to step two and you contact a doctor and then it becomes work, it becomes work yeah. to advocate, to get seen, to get medical appointments that are booked out sometimes for several months, but your issue is acute and it needs to be addressed now. That's a, a very hard thing to keep balancing. Like you mentioned, when you have kids, work, career, I mean, a family, a household to upkeep, and then you're not feeling well on top of it, but then you're like, I can't even worry about me because- I've got, I've got so much to do on my list that I can just push this all down. And like you said, by the time you get there, any symptoms could be more advanced and you just are feeling you're not 
your optimal self anyway, right. during that, that time. And, and I think that, you know, so many women will relate to kind of what we're speaking about right now, because it's, um, we're always on overdrive all the time. And it's, it's almost to the point where you're in survival mode, you know, by the, by the end of it all, because you're just, you just need to get through the day. You need to get, you know, your family taken care of. You need to get whatever needs to be done at work. Um, who has time for ourselves now? Right. Um, and, and, and that's kind of where I'm, I see a lot that, you know, healthy, your health does suffer. You give that two decades of doing that and, you know, we are dealing with, you know, women in menopause, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women in menopause is that, you know, it might just be metabolic, but it can be stress, right? Um, okay. And so many different things could uh, kind of weigh in to make that happen. And, and, and that's scary to me, right? Um, it, it shouldn't be that way. And and I think obviously, there's lots of factors contributing to it, as we said, but um, certainly, we can make some of that better. I have a question because of, you know, you being a doctor and you, and there's almost like, this is going to come across in a poor way, but it almost feels like doctors have bouncers at their front desk <laughs> in the yeah. sense of like being able to get an appointment and you say, well, I'm really sick or I have something going on and I really need for, for the doctor to see me. And the response is, well, everyone needs to see this doctor. And we've got months and months of outstanding appointments. If we get a cancellation, we'll put you on the wait list for the wait list for the cancellation. How can you advocate for yourself at that point? It's awful. And, you know, coming from the other side of it, we are so well aware of how dysfunctional the healthcare system is right now. Um, and, you know, because we're, even though I'm a physician, I am a patient too. My kids are patients and we navigate this just as much as everybody else. And we're seeing the other side of it as well. Um, and, you know, here's the hard part. Uh, usually I am also booked out about six months and, you know, patients are trying to get in, um, you know, and, and it's the same what you just said, like it's the same sort of speech where our schedulers or, or the nursing staff will have to sort of tell this to patients. But my other question is, what do we do to make it better? Right. Mm -hmm. And and this is unfortunately becoming such a vicious cycle. Um, and I think anybody who is in a healthcare system or part of a group practice or clinic will be struggling with this. Um, I think the only situation where I've seen this not be as much of an issue is a concierge practice um, mm -hmm. where you have sort of ready access to your provider. Um, but that's hard for everybody, right? That can be expensive and it's not necessarily something that um, all people have access to or the resources to do. Um, and I mean, I, I, I wish I had a solution to it, but this is unfortunately what healthcare has become. And I think, and I 100% sympathize with patients who've become disillusioned with healthcare. I mean, if you can see, you know, the healthcare burnout as well, yeah. providers and doctors and nurses have become disillusioned with healthcare because of all of this as well, right? right. Um, so I think it's happening on both sides. I think that burnout is happening um, both from a patient standpoint and medical standpoint. Um, and and truly, I think that it's, it's because medicine has become so institutionalized is that, yes, you do have that bouncer, you have that kind of per gatekeeper in, you know, at, at the front of the clinic, you know, trying to um, you know, schedule patients and get them in a court appropriately. Uh, but this is, it's a very, very frustrating system. And I hundred percent sympathize, you know, with, with everyone. The one thing I will say, and I kind of joke about this is that, you know, the doctors in the back seeing patients, not a single one of them is going to be in the back doing their nails or like taking a break or like, you know, grabbing lunch. It's, it's, we, everyone is sort of working as hard as possible to get patients seen and treated in an appropriate manner. Um, and so that's where I think some of this burnout is happening as well, because, you know, it's like, well, we're working as hard as possible, like how much, you know, it, there, it, it's, it's just one person to like however many numbers of patients. And so the issue here is that healthcare is not scalable. And that is exactly where, um, you know, preventive health does become so important so that, you know, when 
things arise, you have that relationship with that doctor, you are able to access somebody to ask those questions. Um, you're able to become a self advocate and understand what to look for, and that sort of thing. Um, and that's exactly where, you know, organizations like endo found and, um, you know, all these other healthcare organizations can be of high value. Um, but I think it's also important to make sure that patients and users are engaging appropriately as well. That's excellent advice because I, I I know that's a very big roadblock. And like you said, it's not just on the patient side, it's on the doctor side too, with the, the burnout. I think the burnout is mutually felt and yeah. that the frustrations are very similar in the sense of doctors want to help their patients. Patients want to be helped by their doctors mm -hmm. and somehow there's a skew in the overall format of the system that makes it very yeah. difficult for both sides. Yeah. It's like basically you know, how do you putting like all that toothpaste back into the tube, right? It's like a very, it's such a roadblock. Um, because again, like it might be me, one, one doctor, it like, look, look at an ER, right? Like it might have just a handful of, you know, doctors and nurses, but it might have hundreds of patients in the waiting room. And, and so it's, it's highly frustrating. That is, you know, I absolutely get it, especially, you know, if your child is sick or you're feeling terrible and, um, and right now it's just not efficient. And I wish I had a ready solution for it, but this is kind of a billion, $10 billion problem to be solved right now. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about it because I think it needs to be discussed more, especially from different sides of the aisle, um, so to speak, um, from the patient and then also from a doctor. So right. it's, a, it's a good conversation. I know we have a lot more to cover and I hope that you'll come back and join us for right. uh, part two. <laughs> I would love it. Yes, yeah, so we have lots to talk about. Uh, and, I, and I think that, you know, especially in the women's health space um, and how we can be helpful to women long term, um, because because, you know, my passion specifically is, you know, it doesn't matter to me kind of how things are going for the next three to six months, you know, in terms of dietary pattern and obesity. And like, the, we're thinking about the next 40, 50 years of your life, right? And, and that's kind of the mentality that I think does need to change in medical practice, because again, like the healthcare system is all about blowing out fires left and right right now, but we need to take a step back and really start to emphasize, well, how can we make people healthier earlier so that they have longer and healthier lives? Um, our, our life expectancy in the U S has dropped, unfortunately. And, and so we, um, you know, there's a lot to be done. <laughs> there's a lot to be done. And that says an awful lot about how our healthcare system is, is trending. If our life expectancy is decreasing, yeah. I mean, to go back to my, my grandfather always used to say, and I know this is almost a cliche thing, but it's true that if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. It's so true. It is so true. And, and, you know, part of that is also, you know, feeling bad while going through life is also not a way to live life. And, and I think that's wellness and, you know, feeling good is, is just so important. Um, and I think we need to start talking more about that. No, I, uh, I'm so glad that you took the time out of your very, very busy schedule <laughs> to be able to have this discussion with us. Um, we'll, we'll plan something again in the near That's future great. with you. Thank you for your work and for, for advocating for good overall health and quality of life. You too. I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm so um, excited to see that others are as passionate about this um, as, as I am. And uh, yeah, I look forward to doing this again soon.